Amusement rides seem like the ultimate expression of creative freedom for engineers. But in reality, there are a number of guidelines for the design of amusement rides set in the United States through ASTM. These guidelines cover things ranging from the design of restraints on rides to the maximum g-forces they can experience. Today we'll be taking a deep dive into the standards set by ASTM and how they affect the rides you enjoy. Starting with restraint design. Restraints are broken into five different areas by ASTM based on the g-forces riders will experience on the ride. It's important to remember that g-forces are just a measure of acceleration, and so for simplicity, ASTM breaks the different axes riders will be exposed to g-forces into x, y, and z. x being forwards and backwards relative to a rider's eyes, y being left and right relative to a rider's eyes, and z being up and down relative to a rider's eyes. Area 1 restraints are the least restrictive and generally refers to no restraint at all. Think of a ride like a carousel. Going to the next level, Area 2 restraints may accommodate multiple riders or just one. They may have a final latching position that is fixed or variable relative to the rider, meaning they can lock in multiple positions or just one. The rider or the operator may be able to unlock it. It can be manually or automatically opened or closed, and redundancy is not required. Some examples of restraints like this are those on old aero mine trains and the locking bar on scrambler type attractions. Area 3 steps it up a little bit, with most of the same requirements as Area 2, except that these restraints must be capable of locking in multiple positions relative to the rider, and that the operators must check that the restraints are secured in some way. Think of the large adjustable lap bar on Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, for example. Area 4 restraints step things up further by requiring one restraint be provided for each individual rider, requiring that restraints must be automatically locked, that only the operator have the ability to unlock the restraint, and that redundancy is now required. This redundancy can be achieved through multiple independent systems in the restraint system, such as two independent locking pins, or by a separate device like a seatbelt. Think of older B&M looping coasters with simple over-the-shoulder restraints like Raptor at Cedar Point. Area 5 is reserved for the most intense rides. It has all the requirements of Area 4, but adds a requirement for some kind of external way of verifying that a restraint is secured. This is usually accomplished through a seat sensor. This is a magnetic sensor that verifies every restraint is in the correct position before it allows the ride to start. Area 5 restraints also require two restraints or one fail-safe restraint. An example of rides with two restraints are top spins, which use an over-the-shoulder restraint as well as a lap bar. Most Area 5 restraints opt for having one fail-safe restraint instead. Some examples of this are the restraints used on RMC coasters, which use two independent hydraulic systems to secure each lap bar. The area a ride's restraints must comply with is determined by this graph. Ride manufacturers must calculate the g-forces their rides will subject riders to and plot them on this graph to determine the minimum qualities of their restraints. Let's do a quick example with the Zamperla Skater Coaster. Plugging in the recorded g-force data from the ride recorded by g-force productions, we can see that this ride falls under class 2. Examining the ride, we see that it uses one lap bar for six riders that can lock in multiple positions and is not redundant. This makes it a class 3 restraint, making it more compliant than it needs to be. Now let's examine g-force limits. These are hard maximums placed on the g-forces rides can exert on riders in specific directions. The limits are slightly increased if riders are in a prone position. Feel free to pause to examine these limits in more detail. Let's examine the rules on transitioning from one direction to another. ASTM defines sustained time of riders experiencing a certain amount of g-forces to be any acceleration lasting longer than 200 milliseconds. When riders are exposed to sustained high negative or positive accelerations, ASTM requires there be at least 200 milliseconds between these forces. The change in g-force is limited to no more than 15 g per second. This means that a ride cannot go directly from keeping riders weightless to throwing them into their seats. Instead, there must be a transition time of 200 milliseconds or more. Exceptions are made for g-forces that are well within the limits and those that are very brief lasting less than 200 milliseconds. This flowchart by ASTM explains how this rule is applied. Know that this rule applies to g-force changes on the x, y, and z axis, but is particularly focused on the z axis that meaning up and down relative to the rider. 
Let's take another example. Skyrush at Hershey Park is known for its fast transitions from negative to positive Z g-forces, but is it ASTM compliant? Here is a graph of the g-force data provided by g-force production starting from the first drop on the coaster. Mind you that this data is not extremely accurate as it was only measured on a smartwatch, but we can clearly see a well-defined transition between peak g-forces in both the positive z and negative z directions. Here entering the third negative z moment on the ride, we can see a textbook 200 millisecond transition from around plus 3 to 0 g. Entering the fourth negative z moment, we can see a very fast transition from positive z forces to negative. Here we can see the designers opted to keep forces lower temporarily during the transition time before riders experience the stronger forces later on in the element. So yes, even a ride as intense as Skyrush is ASTM compliant, and its designers likely worked hard to ensure that it was compliant. To round out this video, we'll do a flyover of some other ASTM rules regarding ride design. There are time limits on how long riders may be exposed to a particular level of acceleration in the z-axis. This is explained on this graph shown on screen. Riders may spend an unlimited amount of time at up to plus 2 or minus 1.1. Anything stronger than this has time limits for any single moment. Amusement rides must be designed to last for at least 35,000 operational hours. An operational hour is an hour the ride is actually running and cycling as normal. For a seasonal amusement park, this accounts for about 25 years of operation. For rides with long load and unload times, manufacturers can use this formula to determine an allowable shorter lifespan for their attraction. ASTM also provides guidance on ride control systems that stipulates that rides must have accessible e-stop buttons that bring the ride to a safe, controlled stop. They also provide guidelines on evacuation pathways and fencing, as well as ride area fencing and operator positioning. That's a general overview of the ASTM standard for amusement ride design. Keep in mind that this only applies to the United States, and it's not even required by law in every state. However, most ride manufacturers opt to follow these rules regardless of where they do business, and the standard is only likely to become law in more states and even in other countries going forward. Also note that rides designed before the standard can still be considered compliant, but need to have records of their safe operation. If a major modification is made to an old non-compliant ride, it should be brought into compliance. If you found this video interesting, I provided a link to the full standard in the description of this video for you to read. If you enjoyed this extra nerdy video on ride design, be sure to check out my other videos on ride safety. As always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.